Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Again, my name is Ravi, your MC for this afternoon. Welcome to the Straits Times, Ministry of Education National Current Affairs Quiz 2015. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the fourth year. And every year, I may be the quiz master, but I learn something every year. In fact, I learn a lot every year through the processes. And of course, with my engagement with all of our young Singaporeans and uh, foreigners alike. Allow me to give you a quick review of what to expect. In a moment, you'll hear from the Straits Times. Right after that, we'll see four teams compete uh, in the current affairs quiz. The top team today will get to bring home vouchers worth $600. Now, this event is made possible by the organizers of Straits Times and the Ministry of Education with the generous support of Singapore Press Holdings Foundation, our presenting sponsor. Let's give them both a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. This campus talk is part of the news outreach program organized by the Straits Times and the Ministry of Education, also known as the Big Quiz. It aims to promote an understanding of global and local issues, civics, through reading newspapers. It is specially designed for our young people like you and sometimes young adults in the mind like the rest of us in Singapore, like me, for example, always thinking young to keep it nice and vibrant in Singapore. The talks run in tandem with weekly primers published in the opinion section of each Monday's issue of the Straits Times between the 23rd of March to the 20th of July. The primers cover topics such as sports, civil society, education and transport. They not only give you a deeper understanding of the insights into the issues of the day, but will also, most importantly, set you thinking. Very useful for those of you taking the GP papers very soon, yeah? Apart from the event at Catholic Junior College today, we will have five other talks and quizzes in a series this year. Our other hosting schools are Anderson Junior College, as a matter of fact, we'll be there on the 29th of April, River Valley High School, Tampanese JC, Yishun JC, and Pioneer Junior College. The journalists from the Straits Times will also be reporting on each talk and quiz show. So, don't be surprised if they approach you for your thoughts after today's event. In fact, at the end, we'd also like for you to uh, take part in a very special survey where we'll flash what's required right there on the big screen in front of you. We'd like to have your thoughts as well as to how we can further improve the big quiz as the years go by. Before we dive into the quiz, we have with us today Deputy, uh, Deputy Political Editor from The Straits Times, she's Fiona Chan, and she will be talking about Singapore's budget and what it means for you, our young people of Singapore. Now, the talk will be followed by the most interesting thing right here during the talk would be the engagement of all of you, the Q&A session. So we urge you to take part in that, ask as many questions as you like, and of course, we'd like to remind you to introduce yourselves and tell us your name nice and clear as well. We encourage you to take part in this and ask Ms. Chan as many questions as you like. Now, let me introduce our speaker for the day. Fiona Chan is Deputy Political Editor for The Straits Times, where she has spent eight years covering political, economic, and business news. She also um, has co-authored a book about the policies and history of the Monetary Authority of Singapore and contributed to two other books commemorating Singapore's 50th anniversary. A graduate from the Wharton School of University in Pennsylvania in Harvard University, she was formerly an investment banker at the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Now, of course, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to proudly introduce to you, she's standing by, right on stage, right Miss Fiona Chan. With all of it, let's welcome Miss Chan. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us here today at the Straits Times Ministry of Education National Current Affairs Quiz. I know some of you are not from CJ, so thanks for taking the time to travel here. Um, as you can see, I am Deputy Political Editor for the Straits Times. 
um, but my background is mainly in business and economics. So later on, if you want to ask me questions about politics or economics or business, please feel free to do so. Okay, so today we are here to talk about the Singapore budget and why you should care about it. And I mean, when I was 18 years old, I had no idea what it was. So it's a bit of a struggle, but please put up with me. Okay, basically, Singapore's budget is like any other budget, like your budget. Everybody has a budget. You have a certain amount of money to spend over a certain period of time, and you have to find the best way to spend it. So let's go through this. Okay, the government has a certain amount of money to spend every year, and it has to choose how to spend this money, whether it should spend it on defence or education, build more schools, give more subsidies to students for school fees, for instance, or, or hire more teachers. So, in other words, it's an annual allocation of the government's money to different spending needs. And everybody has a limited number of resources, limited amount of money. So it's very important to decide how you're going to spend this money. Um, the government's money mainly comes from taxes. So the taxes that your parents pay, uh, your siblings maybe if they're working, the taxes that uh, companies pay, the taxes they pay on property and cars, COEs for instance. Uh, there's also fees, which if you want to set up a company, you have to pay a licensing fee. And that money goes to the government as well to spend. So governments have to choose how they want to spend that money. And they can spend it on, as I said just now, various different things. Defense, education, health, manpower, building more HDB flats. Uh, they can also choose to give some of the money to the poor and the needy, which Singapore's government is doing more of lately. So, in Singapore, how we break down the spending is between everyday costs. So, the money that you pay to civil servants, the money you pay to ministers, and investments in longer-term infrastructure projects, for instance, building HDB flats or MRTs, or you know, having more bus services. So, those are longer-term projects that, that require money as well. And we divide it up differently because the everyday spending is more or less the same from year to year. And development spending de differs depending on what kind of projects the government is going to be doing. Okay, so this is the breakdown of the government's revenue. Um, the blue one is corporate taxes. I'm not sure whether you can read, but so the company taxes actually account for the biggest portion of government revenue. Um, the red one is GST, which is the second biggest, and then green is personal tax. Sorry, green is contributions from Tamasic, GIC, and MAS. So these are money, this is money that the government earns from investing its reserves, which Singapore has a lot of. Then the purple part is personal taxes, light blue is COEs, and then the rest of it. So as you can see, company taxes make up the biggest portion. And this is actually good for all of you as individuals, because it means that companies pay more taxes to the government than individuals do. Um, and if you set up a company next time, then you might be concerned about that. But for now, if you are a worker, you are actually supporting the government less than the companies are. So Singapore is a good place for you to live if you, know, you work for a company. GST, of course, everybody pays, so that's a, also a big portion. Um, and well, COEs are becoming a bigger portion in recent years. Okay, so this is the breakdown of how the government spends its money. And you might be surprised to know that the government spends most of its money actually on defense. And uh, it's not something that you think about very often because, you know, we are living in peacetime and we have an army and this NS and everything, but you don't really think about buying tanks and, and you know, jet fighters. But that's where we spend most of the money because Singapore is a very small country. We are predominantly Chinese in uh, a region that is predominantly Malay or Muslim. So it's important for us to be able to defend ourselves if the need arises. The next biggest um, part, part of the government spending is actually education. And as you know, Singapore is a meritocracy. And we are very, very interested in making sure that all the students get the best education from young. 
So recently, the government started spending more money, uh, starting from pre-primary all the way until tertiary education. It's not just universities, but also polys and ITEs and training centers. Then you have transport, which uh, is a big bugbear among Singaporeans. So the government has been putting more money into it recently. We have new MRT lines coming up. We have new buses. Um, and Changi Airport is also being expanded. So that all comes under transport. Then there's... Yeah, I can't read from the screen, so... There's health. Uh, I'm not sure if you all know, but uh, from this year onwards, we're going to introduce a universal health insurance scheme. So all Singaporeans will be covered by insurance for life. And you may not be thinking about this right now because you know, you're all young and your parents pay for your insurance. But insurance is very expensive, so it, it really makes a big difference if the government helps you to pay for your insurance. Uh, the rest of it is home affairs, trade and industry, national development, and so on and so forth. But it's important to know that the biggest portions of government spending go to defence, education, transport and health, because these are the main focuses of uh, our government. As you can, there's also a, a pink colour uh, pie that is fairly big. And this, this is not a ministry, this is actually special transfers, which is the money that the government puts aside to help the poor and the needy every year. So the rest of the breakdown is by ministry, but this one is special because it cuts across all ministries. So for instance, it's cash handouts that you give to the poor people. It's subsidies for poorer students who need help with transport costs or school books. Um, and as you can see, it is a fairly decent proportion of government spending. And it's grown over the years because the government has realized that there's a sizable portion of people in Singapore who need more government help. Okay, so how the government decides on its budget, actually it takes an entire year. The budget is delivered in January or February, and then after that, the work starts for the next budget. So what happens is you have uh, the finance minister, who is currently Mr. Taman Shamugaratnam, delivering the budget in parliament. Uh, this year it was in February, around Chinese New Year then the other members of parliament will debate the budget statement. So they will talk about some of the new initiatives that have been introduced and uh, ask questions about them. Then each different ministry will prepare its own budget and present that. So they will tell the rest of uh, parliament how they plan to spend the money that has been allocated to them. So for instance, this year, uh, MOE is um, giving more subsidies to kids to students. Um, and then there's a, this process of each ministry debating its own budget lasts for about one and a half weeks. So the whole thing takes about two weeks. Okay, you may not have uh, read about the budget much, but you might have heard of some of these measures that were actually introduced in budgets over various years. So last year there was the Pioneer Generation Package, which I'm pretty sure all of you who live in Singapore will have heard about by now. Basically, it's giving money to the people who were pioneer citizens of Singapore when Singapore was first, uh, modern Singapore first gained independence. And over the years, there have been different budget measures. So in 2011, every citizen got cash of $100 to $800. So it doesn't matter how old you are, you have gotten some money. Um, and this, coincidentally or not, was an election year. So you do tend to see sometimes during election years, uh, the government tends to be a bit more generous in the budget. So what comes out in the budget is, could be a hint of whether there's going to be an election that year or not. So the government also uses the budget to address certain uh, national developments. So in 2009, there was a massive recession because of the global financial crisis. And the government spent 20 point, or set aside $20.5 billion dollars to save jobs and encourage banks to start lending money so that people would spend money and save the economy. So if you think about the fact that our annual revenue, the government's annual revenue is about 60 or 70 billion dollars a year. 20 billion is actually a lot of that. It's one third of the entire amount of money that you get a year. Okay, and in 2007, there was this other scheme called Workfare, which tops up the incomes of lower income workers and it became a permanent feature, and that was very important, as I will explain later. Okay, so for you all individually, as 18-year-olds, how does the budget affect you? Unfortunately, 
um, there are only a few measures that affect you at this age. Okay, first of all, you all get some money. So Singaporeans aged 17 to 20, you will get money in your post-secondary education account, which you can then use to pay for tertiary education fees, so um, undergrad as well as postgrad, and not just for university, but also other types of uh, institutions if you want to go to them. And if you are going to study law, you can actually use it to help pay for your bar exam fees. The other thing you might have known by now is that this budget, um, the government decided to waive all exam fees. So your A-levels are now free. Not that I think that <laughs> helps much, but uh, there's, it costs the government $26 million a year. You still have to sit for your A-levels, just that you don't have to pay for them anymore. So uh, it actually saves each family up to $900 because exams do cost money. Um, government is also giving more financial help for students who need it, including for transport, coming to school and going back, and financial assistance. Okay, the budget is probably more important to the rest of your family at this point, but it will also affect you as you grow up. So your grandparents this year, they got something called the Silver Support Scheme, which is for the bottom one-fifth to one-third of Singaporeans uh, age above 65. And basically, it gives them cash handouts so that they can meet their daily expenses. Um, and this helps everybody in the family because then, you know, if the government is helping you with your grandparents' costs, then you don't have to pay so much for them too. So your parents also benefited from various other measures such as higher CPF contributions, higher CPF interest rates, all these things that you don't really care about right now, but eventually you will. Income tax rebates. Um, and then your younger siblings or cousins also got money in various accounts. So you can see that the government actually has this very careful way of allocating money to students. If you're below six years old, you have a child development account. So that pays for childcare fees and health costs, for instance. Then between seven and 16, so that's basically primary, one and sec primary school and secondary school, you have an educative account. After that, you have a post-secondary account, which is what you all have. And beyond that, there are other new measures that are being set up. So for your future, these are the three main things in this year's budget that will affect you. Okay, Skills Future, which is a new initiative for people to keep learning even after school. So after you graduate from JC and then you go to university or poly or uh, somewhere else and then you graduate from that, you start work, you will still need to learn some skills along the way because a lot of the things that you're learning right now actually you might not want to use, you might not need to use in the real world. You need to learn things like engineering um, or computer science. So some of you probably learn computer science. But if you want to learn it while you are working, there's a new Skills Future account that will help. Okay, um, so just to round up this, the other reason the budget is important is because it sets the government direction for the next few years. So these are the principles that will define Singapore when you become um, contributing members of society. So we are moving away from a focus on academics and education in your first few years to learning throughout life and learning skills rather than just you know, memorizing textbooks. Uh, so that's where Skills Future comes in because everybody gets $500 to start to continue learning throughout your life. You can take language courses, you know, you can learn how to be a plumber or electrician, which is actually very important. You can learn how to cook. Uh, so that also feeds into the next point, which is many different paths to success. So for the longest time in Singapore, there's, a, there's been this notion that you have to go to schools, go to a good school and go to a good university, get a degree, and then only then can you become successful. But now we're trying to say that actually everybody can be successful in different ways. You can be a really good chef. You know, you could be, plumbers earn a lot of money. And we shouldn't just look at one, one path to success and say that's the only way to go. Uh, the government's also giving more, more money to people who need help. So previously there was a sense that people should rely on themselves. So you save up your own CPF money and then you pay for your own needs. But the government has recognized that more people need help and we're moving towards a direction of more social support. There's also a problem of an aging population. Uh, more people are growing old and there aren't enough young people to replace them. So some of these measures help to deal with an aging population. And all this adds up to higher spending for the government. So at some point, 
we will have to raise taxes in order to meet the higher spending. And all of you will probably have to pay higher income taxes or higher GST when it's your turn to do so. So these are the main concepts of the budget and why you should care about it. I know it may not be very convincing at this point, but eventually you will realize how important it is you know, and how you should define the budget when you guys grow up. Some of you will go into the civil service, some of you will go into different ministries or ministry of finance. And then you think about the kind of Singapore that you want to live in and to work in. And that will all be partly encapsulated in the budget. Okay, that's all from me for now. Thank you very much, Fiona, for that comprehensive analysis of this entire budget. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to bring you through the Q&A process, we have a very, very excited individual because she's been assigned to be the moderator. She's one of you. I take pride in inviting a JC2 student up, the lovely Miss Ng Kok Yin. Give her a round of applause, shall we, ladies and gentlemen? So good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm calling, and I hope everyone is as excited as me as I am for today's big budget, a big quiz today. So thank you for your insight, Miss Fiona, Miss Fiona Chan. So um, now we will move on to the question and answer session today. And just to note, when you guys proceed to the microphones near the aisles, do make sure that you state your name your class. If you're from another school, uh, do state your school as well. Um, do make sure that the question is phrased as a question and make it as succinct as possible. So now, is there anyone that's interested in asking a question? Don't be shy, come on. It doesn't have to be about the budget. It can be about anything you want to talk about. Okay, it's okay. If um, there's no question for now, let me just start off uh, with a question of my own. So the, the talk was actually really interesting, and I like how um, Ms. Chan actually summarized it so nicely. So um, just wondering is that, um, what's your personal take on the, this year's budget? And like, is it comprehensive enough uh, to cover the current needs of Singapore and Singaporeans? And maybe, is there any more that you think the government should address or do to make it even more comprehensive? Oh, that's a very good question. I mean, every time the budget comes out, you have to remember that this budget is only for the current year, but it also is in context of uh, the general direction that the government is moving in. And I'm not sure whether you know this, but we have to hold elections in Singapore every five years. And uh, in that amount of time, that five years, the budget has to balance. So if you spend more in a few years, then you have to spend a bit less in the other years of that five-year term so that overall the budget will balance. So this is seen as one of the last budgets for the current term of government, which means the elections will be held probably either this year or next year. And uh, the finance minister himself actually said that this budget puts in, finishes uh, a lot of the initiatives that they wanted to put in place since the last election. So in that sense, even though this budget has, a, has some fewer measures than other budgets, it is part of a, a bigger puzzle and that has sort of been completed this year. So in previous years, we helped some of the older people. We gave a lot of um, incentives to middle... Hello. So this year continued some of that and we saw some new initiatives like Skills Future, which would help workers throughout their lives. So in that sense, it was quite a comprehensive budget, especially looking at where it stands in the overall term of government. And no one could find anything to complain about. So every budget, people will complain. They will say, oh, you didn't give enough to this group. 
you know, or you spend too much on this group, you spend too much on this ministry, what about all these other things that we need? So it's quite significant that this year no one said anything bad about the budget, uh, including the opposition parties who all supported the, gov the, the budget in Parliament. Interesting. So, any questions? Because, I mean, like what she has said is that elections probably will be coming up soon, this year and next year, and it's nice to actually look at the budget and wonder, is no, it's this a budget that, you know, is trying to hint at the election? as well now, as what she has mentioned in her speech. And that how it's so comprehensive that actually people have nothing to say. And that's actually quite a fit for the government as well, if you think about it. So like, um, is there any questions? Please do ask. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Ms. Chan. Um, I'm Phoebe from Daman High. So my question is quite broad. My question is quite broad. It's about censorship. So um, other countries often criticize that our media in Singapore is heavily censor censored. So what are your views on the issue? Thank you. Right. Okay, I know this is a topic that everyone is very interested in. And um, first off, I have to say that, thanks for your question. Uh, I have to say that as someone who works in SBH, we do not have censorship in the way that other media are reporting about. So we have a very strict policy at the Straits Times of not showing draft articles to anybody outside the newsroom, even if you're the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister has never asked to see them. So I want you all to be assured that the articles that we're writing are not vetted by anybody. Having said that, of course, there are certain things that we have to be careful of as journalists, especially in the political arenas or the social arenas. Uh, Singapore is a multi-religious and multi-racial society, and people do get very sensitive over a lot of things, as you can see on social media. So it's uh, very important for us as journalists to be responsible about what we are writing about and to be careful that we don't inadvertently incite any unhappy sentiments among any group in society. It's not just race and religion, and nowadays there are so many other divides. There's you know, the income divide, there are different interest groups, uh, animal rights, gay rights, migrant worker rights, and there's a lot of scope for people to be unhappy about what you're writing about. It doesn't mean that you don't write about it, it just means that sometimes you have to write about it more sensitively. And uh, that should not be construed as censorship. <laughs> it should be seen as what it really is, which is a duty for us to make sure that you know, society stays harmonious and unified and not devolve into chaos. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. But I do have to add on. So, but in seeking to be responsible and tactful, are we not avoiding a lot of debates and necessary debate to deal with? Because these are sensitive topics. That must be debated. But a lot oftentimes if you're just trying to be responsible, then they just go, no one talks about it and it fosters into bigger problems. Um, I think, I mean, if you, you guys are all on Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat, I don't know what's the latest thing, but uh, there's clearly a huge amount of debate going on about any topic you can think of. Uh, the problem, of course, is when some of this debate goes into the area of uh, being very offensive to certain groups. And then, you know, you get people hauled up for sedition and for putting up certain videos. But uh, I don't think that people are afraid to debate anything in Singapore. And we do see our role in the media as trying to bring up some of these topics for our discussion, but also to to make sure we present a val balanced viewpoint, which I think everybody wants, right? You don't want to have these comments on social media, only have one side to it and be very, very uh, vehement about it. So what we try to do is bring a topic up for discussion and we don't shy from that. We will talk about it. We will present both sides of the, the, the case. We'll talk to people from who, are, who agree with it, people who don't agree with it. And then we will leave it for people to discuss. So we don't want to get hauled up for sedition either. And uh, I don't think that um, we've ever clamped down on anything that, you know, we think it's worth debating, but just because we don't want to get involved. I mean, journalists, you know, we get a lot of hate mail, and that's always seen as a sign of success because that means someone's talking about your story, something is being discussed. 
So feel free to send, I mean, try not to send hate mail, but feel free to send mail. And, you know, we encourage everybody to discuss and debate as much as possible and to send us ideas on what you want to see in the paper being discussed. Um, I mean, sometimes we have columnists who write opinion pieces, so they present their view and then people do write in and we'll publish those and uh, hopefully that, that inspires more debate. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Thank you. Thank you. So is there any more questions on the floor? Hi. Hi. I'm Jingying uh, from CJC. Okay, uh, I heard about the silver support scheme and uh, where many elderly people, uh, mostly low income, get uh, payouts every few months. Do you think Singapore is heading towards a welfare type of system in this route? That's not a very good question. Um, if you ask the government, they will give you a very careful answer, something along the lines of, uh, we know that we need to give more social support, there are lots of groups out there that need more help, but we are very careful not to become one of those Western societies where welfare is unsustainable and each generation has to pay for the previous generation's uh, benefits. So, it's, I mean, it's a careful answer, but it's actually quite accurate in the sense that I think Singapore's priority is always to make sure that each generation pays for itself. So, within one generation, uh, well, in this case, because the pioneers didn't have much money when, when they were starting out in Singapore, they had very, very low wages. They were all these Samsui women working for like cents a day. So um, we need to help them a bit more in future generations. And I think that's what we're working towards. But your generation, hopefully, you will not have to pay for your parents' benefits. You will pay only for your own. You help the poorer people in your cohort around you. And I think as long as we stick to that, principle of self-reliance within a generation and also I think I mean those of you who will eventually work and earn taxes I'm not sure if you know this uh, pay taxes I'm not sure if you know this but only one third of Singaporeans pay taxes so if you do pay taxes you are already earning you know quite a lot compared to your fellow Singaporeans and there should be a sense that you want to help these people who are not earning as much as you are. These people that you might have gone to school with, you know, whose kids are going to school with your kids. So a sense of community responsibility within each cohort, I think that will strengthen as time goes by. But we will never, as far as I see it now, never move towards a state where we just blindly give out welfare to anybody who is unemployed or who doesn't want to work. So that is not... That's not the direction we're heading in. Hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, you said that this is for those pioneers that uh, don't really have ma much income from the start. So do you think this is like a one-time thing or will it take off into something much more important, much more substantial? Like currently there's only a few months payout. Will it take off into something like uh, monthly payouts? Uh, even if it's monthly payouts, it will just divide that amount um, so right now they're giving out, if I'm not wrong, between $200 and $600 every three months. So if it's monthly, it will just be divided by three. And the Pioneer Generation Package, which was announced last year, that was a real one-off for people who were born, who were citizens and above the age of 18 during 1965, if I'm not wrong. Silver support actually is a permanent scheme. So in that sense, it will always be around. You will always be paying for the people who are older and who need help. But the government has accumulated a lot of money and the good thing about finance is that you have some money and then you can invest that and you earn interest on that and that becomes a sustainable way to pay for a permanent scheme like silver support. So there are things that will be one off, like pioneer generation. Sometimes they give out cash, you know, if they're doing very well. And there are things that will be permanent like silver support, like MediShield Life, which is universal health insurance. And for something that is permanent, the government will try and find a way to make sure that the funding is sustainable and doesn't become a burden on future generations. So like MediShield Life, for instance, those people who have pre-existing conditions uh, will have to pay a bit more. Those people who earn a bit more won't get as many subsidies. And that's how we even it out. We're trying to make sure that the people who need the most help get help from people who can afford it the most. 
And in that sense, I think even if it's a, a, a permanent scheme or we're heading towards a, a direction where we have more of these lifelong schemes, it will still be sustainable. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So is there any other questions on the floor? Because um, it's not just related to the budget. You know, um, Ms. Chan has a lot of expertise, especially on the areas, areas of politics and um, economy. So it would be okay to ask some questions you know, related to a uh, general paper, if you wish. You know, and also, any questions that, oh, that will be related? Oh, thank you. So. Hi, what's up? Um, I'm Marcus. I'm from CJC. <laughs> This one is a purely rhetoric question. Um, given with um, current world events, how do you think our budget is going to gravitate? Is it going to uh, gravitate towards a, a particular sector in particular? Uh, do you notice any prevail prevalent uh, trends in the budgets over the past few years? Sorry, can you say that again in the last part? Um, do you notice any prevalent trends in the budget over the past few years and how do you think it's going to gravitate uh, in, in the future? Right, okay. Um, thanks for your question. The budget, because it's a national budget, it's often more influenced by local events and local needs than international needs. But there are some, some occasions where something really bad happens throughout the world and that affects Singapore a lot. So for instance, in 2009, when uh, all these banks in America collapsed and there was a big recession and Singapore had to use the budget to address some of those needs. And what they did was uh, give companies money so that the companies could pay their workers. And this meant that instead of laying off their workers, the companies kept the workers on. And this is very important because if you lose your job, there are a lot of things you can't pay for anymore. You don't have CPF contributions. You can't pay for your house, even your children's school fees. You know, simple things like taking a bus and a taxi suddenly cost a lot more given that you're not earning anything. So the ability to hold on to your job is very important. And I think the government is never shy about throwing money, not say throwing money, about allocating the necessary funds uh, in times of great distress when there are big global developments that affect Singapore. But these are always very carefully framed as uh, one-off special measures. So in terms of the direction that the budget is taking, there's, we are seeing a lot more help for the poor and the needy. We're seeing a lot more money being set aside for special transfers. And because of that, there will need to be more money raised in terms of taxes. Um, so the general trends, uh, I highlighted my presentation just now in terms of you know, being more, uh, giving more social support, uh, focusing on lifelong learning and skills and giving money to that. Those, I think, will probably be the, the major trends that define the budget over the next few years. Cool, thanks. Thank you. That was nice. That was a nice point. So, um, oh, okay. Let's wait for that lady down there to approach the mic. Uh, hi, my name is Farana. Hi. I'm from CJC. Um, According to the budget, there's a few like there's some money put into education and stuff. So I was wondering, what should the main purpose of education be? Like, should it be to eliminate inequality? Eliminate inequality, is yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe you would like to you know bring it to more specifics. Like, what do you mean by you know, like um what should we like direct our education system towards? Okay, I haven't been in the education system for a long time. I don't want to say how many years. But all of you are currently in the education system. So this is a question that you should all be thinking about. What do you want your education system to look like? What do you want to learn in school? And I think, firstly, you have to think about what you want to do in life. You know, if you, you want to do a certain job, then you have to start thinking about what you want to learn in school towards that job. But it's becoming increasingly difficult to do that because jobs change so quickly and uh, now with robots and drones and so many new developments happening, the jobs that you once wanted may no longer exist by the time you graduate. So one very big focus of the education system as we are moving towards it now is trying to make education um, 
relevant for the rest of your life. So that doesn't mean that what you learn the first 18 years, that's it. You know, you, you majored in biology or literature and then you're stuck doing, I mean, you probably want to do that, but you are stuck becoming like a biologist or, you know, um, in the arts. So even if you study literature in school, you may want to go on to become a doctor. You may want to be an engineer. And the education system shouldn't be seen as something you only do in the first 18 years of your life. It should be seen as something that you do throughout life in different causes and training. Uh, and that is all part of what we are trying to do to eliminate inequality, specific to your question. Inequality is a very big problem in Singapore, and it's a very real problem. You know, right now when you're in school, you don't see it as much maybe, but when you go onto the workforce, you realize that some people um, who didn't, right now, given the current education system, who didn't go to the right schools, didn't get the right degrees, they are at a disadvantage. But that shouldn't be the way things are. We should try to strive for a society where no matter what your skill is, what your talent is, even if you have no skills and talents but you work very hard, you should be able to attain the same kind of success. So definitely, eliminating inequality is a very, very important part of the goals of the education system. And Finance Minister Taman actually used to be Minister of Education. So for him in particular, this is a very important area. And one of the ways that he's always said we are trying to eliminate inequality in the education system is to start earlier. So, you know, even from pre-primary and kindergarten, everybody should be learning the same things. Everybody should get the same chances. It shouldn't be that you can't afford kindergarten, so you don't go to kindergarten. Then you don't learn the ABCs, and you go to primary one, and you don't know how to say anything. Um, and all this idea of streaming, of having good schools only in wealthy areas, um, we are re really looking all of that so that people have the same chance at doing well as long as they're willing to work hard. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, me? Hi, Ms. Chan. I'm Hi. from Diamond High School. I have one interesting question for you. Uh, what do you think of job politics at work in East Asia? And how do you think, uh, and what are the challenges that you think Singapore face in job politics? And how do you think we can go about resolving these challenges? Like, what are the, some, some, are, some of the mentality or strategies that we can adopt? Geopolitics in East Asia. Sorry, did you say East Asia specifically? So, are you referring to any incident in particular, or is this a general question? Well, it's just a general question about political science. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I don't know how many of you do politics, uh, regional politics or Asian politics, but uh, East Asia is an area that has been particularly um, interesting lately. So, it basically covers China, Japan, and Korea, um, mostly. Oh, I, spent, I just spent two years in Japan, so it's a very interesting experience being a Singaporean in Japan. Uh, every country, I mean, these countries in East Asia, they have a very long history, China, Japan, Korea, and they didn't always get along. Um, sometimes now even they don't always get along. A lot of it has to do with World War II, where Japan tried to show the world that it was the best Asian country. And in many aspects, it is a very superior Asian country. Um, but because of what happened you know, 60, 70 years ago, there are still tensions that are going on right now. And these are very relevant for Singapore also, because we are majority Chinese. And then um, some of our grandfathers, even our parents, came from China. We might want to work in Japan. So for instance, when I went to Japan, my grandmother was very unhappy about it because she was in Singapore when the Japanese were here, and she has this idea that all Japanese people are terrible monsters. So, you know, these scars that uh, are left, they go on for generations. And it's very important that Japan and China and Korea work things out among themselves so that it doesn't affect other countries around them. So, in terms of geopolitics, what this means is that in some cases, I'm not sure whether you guys remember, but a few years ago, when there was tension between China and Japan, this played out in economic ways also. So people in Japan would boycott China goods, people in China would attack Toyota factories and so on and so forth. So it's uh, still a very clear and present danger that um, 
these underlying tensions will spill over into real uh, economic problems and real political problems. And I have no recommendation for what China and Japan and Korea should do, but what Singapore has done is always taken a very pragmatic approach. I mean, we are a very young country, but we have been scarred by war. And we could have chosen the path of never forgiving anybody who has ever attacked us. But um, if we did that, we would have a lot of problems also. You know, we would take these principles and say that, okay, we can't import anything from Japan. Um, maybe we don't like China after a certain period, and then we are not going to import anything from China. Uh, and that hurts all our businessmen, which means it hurts the economy, and then it hurts everybody's jobs. So the best way to, to deal with this is for everybody to sit down and work it out, which fortunately China and Japan and Korea are starting to do now. Um, but for us also, as Southeast Asia, we have to think about how we want to align our priorities and our friendships with China and Japan and Korea, and it gets quite complicated. So some of you might end up in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and you have to worry about this also. So the way forward is always try to be friendly to everybody, not over-friendly, but to maintain good relations and try not to let old grudges come in the way. Because I mean, people involved in the war, most of them are no longer even around. And it's just a matter of trying to get over that. When I was in Japan, it, Japan is a particularly interesting case because what they learn in school um, does not always reflect reality. And so it's very important, education is very important because you think that everything you learn from your textbooks and your teachers is the gospel truth. And it may, not, uh, it may not be until a few years later that you realize there are many sides to a story. So also be careful of you know, what people around you are learning. And you have to bear in mind that they were taught this in school. So in Japan, they learned that the war, you know, didn't necessarily go badly or that uh, it wasn't necessarily their fault. And then they grow up thinking that and then when you meet them, you tell them your own side of your history books and they get surprised. So it's also important to have personal friends from different countries so that you can see what people are learning and maybe you can teach them what you learned. And I mean, your generation, by the time your generation grows up, hopefully there will be less tension among other Asian countries. Does that answer your question? <laughs> so this is why it's important for Singapore, like Singaporeans, to actually go overseas and you know we have cross-cultural exchange and this is where you ex we get exposed to the difference in culture and also history, especially in education. So is there any more questions? Oh, yes. Hi, uh, I'm Sandy and Hi. I would like to ask a question about uh, income gap in Singapore. So do you think that the income gap in Singapore will continue to widen or will it close up? And whether the government's measure to ensure equity is effective and sustainable in the long run. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, I can see income inequality is a very important topic to all of you, as it should be because it is uh, an area in which objectively Singapore doesn't do as well as a lot of countries. So by some measures, we have one of the biggest income gaps among developed countries. Um, and this is also partly the reason the government is trying to give more help to the poor and the needy. So if you look at this thing called the Gini coefficient, which is how most people measure the income gap, Singapore is one of the highest. But if you take into account government subsidies and other government forms of help, then the gap narrows considerably. So in that sense, yes, government help does narrow the income gap. Uh, over the years, over the last decade especially, it has been narrowing, although the progress has slowed. And part of that is largely because the rich are just getting richer. So, you know, you, there's a limit to how much money you can give the poor to close the income gap. Um, but one way to do it is to make sure that every Singaporean earns more. So even if the income gap is wide, it could be because the rich are earning a lot, but the bottom of the, the uh, income earners are still doing decently, they, you know, they're still earning a decent wage enough to live on. So I think while well, the income gap is an important indicator of how society stands, it's not the only thing to look at. As general, I mean, on average, our per capita GDP is still much higher than many other countries. And as long as um, people even in the bottom layer can live comfortably in Singapore given the costs here, that's also something to look at. Because we should also work towards that. 
the answer to the question? Okay. Oh, yes? Go on. Uh, hi. Hi. <coughs> hi. I'm Ramos from CJ. Uh, just one question. Uh, does affirmative action have a place in society? Does affirmative action have a place in society? A place in society. Yeah, it sounds like a GP question. <laughs> okay, yeah. I got A2 for GP only, okay, so don't use my answer as any kind of model answer. Um, okay, that's an interesting question. And some of you uh, will be applying to universities overseas, and for the first time in your lives, you will be a minority, and affirmative action will matter more to you. So there are many schools of thought on affirmative action, right? Some people think that everybody should be judged on the same basis, whether or not, I mean, regardless of the skin color or their gender. And that's the only way that you know that it's a meritocracy. So affirmative action in a true meritocracy, some people will tell you it has no place. But the truth is also that the reality is that uh, there are a lot of institutionalized structures that make it difficult sometimes for certain groups, certain minority groups, to compete on the same level as other people. So, and this is something that you don't really realize if you are in the majority race or you are in the middle class, you know, and then you just don't think about the fact that there are other groups that might be struggling harder. So I don't think we need to definitely say that, you know, we should have affirmative action or not or even call it affirmative action, but we should always be conscious that there might be structures in place in society that are inherently um, biased against certain groups. And if we are conscious of that, on a case-by-case -case basis, we can look at who needs more help. So this is a very general answer, but uh, if you have more specific examples you want to talk about, we can discuss those also. Uh, like, what's your personal opinion? Well, it's very difficult for me to say because I am in the majority race. And I think if you ask different people who come from different groups what they think, they will all have different answers. Um, I, for instance, I don't believe in affirmative action for women in general because women you know, are often uh, discriminated against. But there are some countries that, for instance, uh, dictate or they have a law that you should have a certain proportion of women on company boards. So because nowadays there are too many men and then there are not enough women, and like Malaysia, I think their quota is 40%. 40% of company boards should have women. And while women will, might complain that, oh, I'm just on a board because there's this law and it's not because I, my, I earn my way on the board, it does help to change the mindset of the society in the sense that you start getting used to seeing women on boards and then you start thinking about them as candidates when you're trying to put together your company board. And to that extent, I think there is some place for affirmative action society, um, but it shouldn't become an overriding priority. It shouldn't be the first thing you think about. It should be only when you realize that there are certain barriers to certain groups and then you try and think about how to break down those barriers not necessarily by saying that, okay, you know, regardless of merit, I'm going to let you, a minority group, um, gain a certain place in, in society, but I will try to break down the barriers so that everybody can play in the same playing field. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Hi. I'm Hello. Jane from Daman High. Uh, I would like to ask a question because uh, Recently, uh, we had the new alcohol ban, uh, yeah, and uh, it sparked a little bit of debate, and a lot of netizens are actually very upset. Then they ask things like, oh, why is the government controlling this and that, this and that? And then, but then, um, there's, o there's also reports that say that uh, the police is taking a more calibrated approach. So uh, I'm just wondering, like, uh, in, your, in your point of view, uh, what kind of approach is the government actually heading to, and is there a gradual shift uh, like from the past to the present, like are they taking a, a different kind of approach to solving the society problems? Yeah. Okay. Well, I suppose the liquor ban would be irrelevant to some of you. Um, it is a ban that, again, okay, a lot of these questions, right, you'll realize um, the answer to them is depends on where you're coming from. 
So for the liquor bans, there are a lot of people who are unhappy about it, especially people who live in areas where you don't get these nuisances. But there are people who live in Robertson Key or you know, in Geylang or Little India, and it's not pleasant every day when you wake up to have to deal with broken glass on your floors because people were drunk and they left the beer bottles there or you know, the smell of vomit and other things elsewhere. So these people are very happy that there is a liquor ban. And actually, Singapore is not the first country to have a liquor ban. A lot of countries do. And this is not a liquor ban. Okay, just to be clear, we're not saying that you shouldn't drink alcohol. It's just that you shouldn't drink it in public where you could theoretically then break the beer bottles on the floor. So you can still drink it at restaurants. You can drink it up to 10.30, if I'm not wrong. And um, it's, it's the government trying to be flexible about it. So it's trying to cater to different needs of society. And this is something that will come up a lot. You realize uh, as you get older that there are so many different groups in society and they all want something different. And the difficulty is trying to balance this, these needs. So we are already quite far behind other societies in catering to that group of people who don't want um, liquor to be sold at a certain time. In the US, in Japan, you know, you can't walk around and drink alcohol at all. So, not in Japan, sorry, in the US. So, uh, I don't think that we are particularly draconian about this. Um, and of course, there will be people who agree and people who disagree. But this is, uh, I'm not sure whether it's indicative of any trend. It's probably just in, because of this particular group of people and the, the problem seems to be getting worse. So, they are trying to clamp down on it. But of course, the root problem is that Singaporeans don't care about each other. You know, because if you were considerate towards your neighbours, then whether or not you drank liquor outside, you wouldn't leave the beer bottles there anyway. So, sometimes laws are in place because people don't behave well. And if we can all show that we can drink responsibly, then there shouldn't be a reason for this law as well. Then do you think education is more important than law, or is law more important than education? Um. Well, that question cannot answer. Uh. <laughs> uh, I mean, in terms of I mean, law, does help in education. And education is not always uh, successful in certain areas, so you need both. But I hope that in schools they are teaching you not to drink and not to break your bottles and you know vomit everywhere in public. And if you internalize these these lessons from young, then it's true that you probably will need fewer intrusive laws as you go older. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sorry to keep you waiting. The young man on the top, um, Hi. the right. Um, good afternoon. I'm Heewon from 1T30. Hi. So I would like to ask, as you know, in Singapore, there are a multitude of students who are PRs and foreigners. And these uh, groups of students will contribute to the Singapore economy in the future. So this brings me to my next point. With a wave of exam fees, do you think it is, in, do you think it is imperative for the government to come up with more ways to meet the needs of this group of students? You mean uh, foreign students in Singapore? Yes, and PRs. Uh, I think there are quite a few scholarships for foreign students in Singapore already and Singapore is actually fairly unique in the sense that these scholarships start before university level. A lot of countries only give scholarships to university students from other countries. But we have ASEAN scholars who start from secondary school. I mean, some of my friends you know, were Malaysian or Chinese and they got some of these scholarships. And I think that uh, Singapore has always been open to the best talent from wherever in the world, especially if after that you want to be a citizen here and contribute to Singapore, um, having gained quite a lot from the Singapore government. In terms of additional help for uh, foreign students, I'm not sure what the, the needs are of these foreign students. Uh, are you talking about financial needs or social integration or you know, giving citizenship? Um, as a student in CJC, I've recently just received my document for my A-level papers this year and with the implementation of the wave of exam fees, um, those classmates in my class, including me, who are foreigners or PRs, did not, um, uh, were not affected by this. So I would like to like, know, like, maybe in terms of finance, like, how we can be helped. Okay, um, I am not familiar with all the scholarship terms, but I think some of the scholarships also take care of exam fees. Uh, and whether all foreign students should also be in included, excluded, um, included in this exemption is a good question. 
I don't have the answer to that. Uh, but I, as a foreigner, you might have also realized that uh, in Singapore, there's been a mood recently that you know Singaporeans uh, maybe should get some special privileges. And taken to an extreme, this is a dangerous idea. In countries like Malaysia, where they give indigenous Malays a lot more privileges, you get very unhappy minority groups. So this is, again, one of those things where you need to balance the needs of different groups. Um, giving Singaporeans some advantages is probably beneficial because we are Singapore after all. You know, we have to take care of our citizens first. But we should not discriminate against um, foreigners in a very extreme way. So if you think of it as a benefit, you know, some Singaporeans, Singaporean students get this benefit that foreigners don't get. There will inevitably be some of those. Uh, they should not, for instance, raise exam fees for foreigners because that, that would be unfair. But I think if you are living and working in a country that you, you weren't born in, you have to um, probably get used to the fact that there are some things, you know, as not the citizen, you might not be able to enjoy. And I don't know if that is right or wrong, but that's the way the system is right now. And uh, hopefully one day you become a Singapore citizen or PR, then you can enjoy all the same benefits. Uh, no, that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's understood that you know the Singapore budget would definitely be more catered towards Singaporeans, and after all, you know it's a budget for the for Singapore and for Singaporeans. So, um, is there any more questions? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, good Hi. afternoon. I'm Uma from Diamond High, and I have one question. Do you believe that there has been enough done for creating a work-life balance in Singapore? Because although there has been many efforts in terms of financial measures, there has, little, there has been little change in birth rates rising or more people getting married. So given this, what other methods do you think that we could do to target people's mindset or change, to change people's opinion? Or what do you think that we as individuals should do? Okay, so like to probably just uh, re repeat her question. Is that she's you're asking about work-life balance, right, if I'm not wrong? Yes, work-life balance uh, to encourage more Singaporeans to, ra uh, to get married so as to raise the birth rate. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, I'm a very bad person to ask about work-life balance because I work all the time. So when I was working in a bank, I was literally working from 9 a.m. to 1 a.m. every day, uh, including weekends. And even as a journalist, you know, you have unpredictable hours. I go in at 10 a.m. I don't go home until midnight or 1 a.m. And as you can see, I'm married <laughs> and uh, it has not prevented the birth rate from going up. So work-life balance, you know, is... It's a topic that we like to talk about a lot, especially people in your generation. Um, but we have to think, you know, work is a part of your life. And hopefully you will find a job that you enjoy and that you don't mind spending nine, ten, eight, nine, ten hours a day on it and having to work on weekends if you have to. And uh, I don't think we should think of work and life as being completely separate. You know, you make friends in the workplace as well. Nowadays, you know, with smartphones, you have to check your email even when you're not at work. So, I know the government is trying to do more to um, create a sense that people should not spend all your time at work. You know, you shouldn't have such long working hours. And that's a good direction. But work-life balance should not be an excuse for not getting married and having kids. If you want to see your boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, you just do your work faster and then you leave earlier and then you have your weekends free. If you want to get married, you can't say, oh, I can't get married because I'm working too hard. If you really wanted to get married, you will find a way to do it. So the work-life balance is not a reason not to get married and have kids. And please remember all this because, uh, well, I married my JC classmate. And so some of you might end up marrying your JC classmates. And so, so, I mean, this is at a time before work-life balance even comes into play. Okay, so... It's important for you to develop your own personal relationships in your own time. Don't let work be an excuse for that. And, uh, I mean, never stay in the office, like, 24 hours a day if you don't have to. Uh. That's my answer. 
uh, nice advice, I suppose. Um, right now, um, the time for Q and A has been up, and thank you for being such a nice audience. I'm, I'm sure Miss Chan. Thank Chan you very much. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs>